For the God of the mountain is still God in the valley when things go wrong. He'll make them right. Amen. I'm glad I can know yes. that I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. A person that doesn't have that assurance, I'm telling you, they're in a miser miserable, miserable shape. I trust. I'm glad that the Word of God is our foundation, our anchor yes. that points us to our heavenly anchor that's behind the veil. And I'm glad we have hope in Him tonight. Praise His Praise His holy name. Hey. But hope you've had a good day today. So good to see all of you here tonight. And a good good to see Brother, uh, brother I started to say Brother Sue and Miss Skip. But Brother and Miss Skip is so, so good to see y'all. We've been praying for y'all. I'm so glad y'all are doing better. And, and everyone here tonight, praise the Lord for His presence, His blessing hey. on, on us all. And God's good. Well, we're going to be in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 1 tonight. 2 Timothy chapter 9, number 1. I want to share with you tonight, I've got four or five questions, we're only going to do two of them tonight. You think this is my Bible, this is actually my notes I preach from, but <laughs> I got a lot of notes. No, it is that, that it is not just my Bible, that's my notes as well, because if I don't have anything, my notes don't come from that, I don't have any notes. But, uh, but anyway, um, we want to share a couple of questions with you from chapter number one of the book of 2 Timothy. And I hope that what we have to share with you will be a blessing. Now, some of you may be wondering why we start services at 5 o'clock. Well, that's when I have to be back over the jail before dark. You know, so uh, we had to start a little early so I don't get in trouble over there with the, with the jailer. But, uh, but I'm, I'm glad you're able to make it. And if, you're, if you haven't eaten yet, I'll try not to preach too long. And hopefully you'll find something. I'm telling you, uh, fast food and everything did kind of scare us everywhere. Yeah. Uh, nobody worked the windows in the, in the kitchen. It's kind of hard sometimes in some places. But, but if you're hungry, we'll try to get you out and maybe you get a, you know, a crack or something on the way home or when you get home, hopefully. Well, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 1, we know, of course, 2 Timothy is the last book, the final epistle that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And what a wonderful book that it, that it is. And we know, as I've said often, that uh, the last words of a, of a person, those are probably the most important words they'll ever utter. Um, I remember, I might have told you the story, there was a man who went in to uh, visit a man in his hospital. <laughs> I don't know why you can tell this was a great place. But anyway, he went to, uh, went to visit a, uh, one of his members in the hospital, and he had tubes all over him, you know, and, and, him, and so um, the man couldn't speak, so he was writing everything down on, on little note pads, and he'd hand it to the person, they'd read, read what he said. So the preacher went up to visit him, and the man was writing something, and he passed away. And the man just didn't read the note, just stuck the note in his pocket. And when he was doing the man's funeral, he remembered he had that same suit on. He wore it to the hospital. And he said, I got Brother Joe's uh, final words right here in my pocket. And he said, he, he took it out and said, I want to read this for his, at his funeral. He says, you're standing on my oxygen tube. So, <laughs> so sometimes the final words you speak are usually very important. <laughs> very, very important. Um, but that's what we have in the book of, uh, the book of Timothy. And I want to I look at some things that Paul said to Timothy and, for, uh, and form or pose a question out of the things that we have here. Let me read you a verse of Scripture, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Verse number 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Verse 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not... Excuse me, should I... Though should I... Should I uh, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Yeah. Now before I read my text, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight to be able to share something that will be a help to someone yeah. in this day in which we live. The dark days, I believe they're dark just before the coming of the Son of Man. 
uh, when that Son of Righteousness shall appear, I pray you help us, Father, to examine our own hearts, yeah. and see, see where we are in our strength, in our spirituality, in our, in our yeah. walk with God, our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And please help us to be what we should be, that we might be right with you before you come, that you might find us busy, faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you look with me in verse number 1, actually we're going to be preaching tonight and Lord willing tomorrow night. We're going to be preaching out of verses 1 to verse number 1 down to verse number 13. But we're going to be looking at these verses in reverse order. So we're going to read verse number 9 down to verse number 13 tonight for our text and share with you some thoughts. Who has saved us? And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. I love that. He brought it to light. He exposed it. It appeared. Uh, it, it came about. Through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. I read, you, read to you out of Matthew chapter number 26, verse 31, and uh, parts all the way down to verse number 35. And Peter made two statements there about his judgment, his judgment of his own spirituality, his own standing before God in his practical life, in his practice. And the first one was when the Lord said that tonight all men shall deny me, or excuse me, we shall be offended because of me. He said, I will not be offended because of you. You're not going to be a cause of stumbling to me. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to watch you and whatever. I, I just got my eyes fixed on you. I'm not going to stumble because of something that you may do or say. And you'll be become an offense to me. The second thing was that the Lord told him in these verses of Scripture that uh, he was going to be taken. And... Uh, he tells Peter, he said, this night, he said, you're going to deny me thrice. And he says, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. So he said, you're not going to offend me. Whatever you do, it's not going to offend me. And I will not deny you. So two statements emphatically, Peter said what he would not do and what he would do. I will die with you, but I will not deny uh, deny you and I will not be offended because you you know Peter really didn't know what he was saying and sometimes we jump all over Peter but you know what sometimes Dean Handy he is as bad or even worse than Peter uh, I look sometimes at when I'm reading in, in the Word of God, looking at the Old Testament, I look read through the through the book of Exodus and Numbers, you know, and you're reading the account of the children of Israel in the wilderness, and then we get into the book of Judges. My goodness, the book of Judges, and and you see how the people of God, as they there they were Mount Sinai, and they had heard the voice of God. They had seen the fire, the the earthquakes, the trembling, and the thunders on the mountain. And Moses, the Bible says, that he even exceedingly fear and quaked at the very omnipotence and awe of God. Moses did. But it wasn't too long after that, just a few days later, after Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days, here we find the people of God had gotten Aaron to make them a golden calf and said, we don't want to happen to this Moses. Make us gods that can lead us back into Egypt and that we can follow them. And here's the people I thought, you know what, if I'd have been there, I would have been with Moses. I would have been the ones that, when he drew the line in the sand, I'd got on Moses' side, the Lord's side. I would have done that. When there was a fiery, a fiery serpent, I wouldn't have been one of them that would have been bitten. I'd have been with God. And I look at all the things that they did, and I'm always saying, I would have not. I would have, yeah. You know what? Here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but when we look at, sometimes when we look at people, we'd say, I wouldn't do that. Or I wouldn't have done that. I've heard people say, when they talk about other people's children, my children aren't going to do that. My children aren't going to be like that. You know what we have to do? We better take us some salt with us. If you like pepper, you can use a little pepper. Maybe get Miss Jane some of her relish if you want to. Because you're going to eat them words. You're going to eat those words. We do not know 
what we're going to do. And sometimes we, it, we look at ourselves and we think of ourselves more highly, the Bible says, than we ought to think. That's what we do. And that's what Peter did. He judged himself wrongly. I, I like what the Word of God says. The heart in Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, the heart is deceitful above yeah. all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The next verse tells me that I, the Lord, He tries our heart. Only He is the one that truly knows our own heart. Today we're on fire for God. Today we're getting out of the boat. Today we're walking on the water. Today we're going in that fiery furnace. I mean, we're doing everything we can. The next day we're running from it from Jezebel. Yeah. That is the way our life is. So we better never say, I will do this or I will do that for God because we don't know what we're going to do until it happens to us. Right. I hope, I hope that should persecution come our way, I hope that I would be one that would stand true to God and love God and be willing to face the fire, face the sword or whatever's going to come my way. I hope that I would be one that would stand true to God and fear in face of fear and everything would come my way. But you know what? Until it happens, I better keep my mouth shut and ask for God's mercy and grace because I believe, I believe that days are, the days are coming that we, we know in the tribulation, we know it's coming in the tribulation period. But are we as God's people going to face anything like that before the tribulation period? So I, did, I wasn't going to mention COVID after last night, but I'm going to mention it. This COVID climate is, a climate is just a one step toward what is coming. Yeah. Now here's, here's what I want to know. Are you and I, are we ready to face what is coming? Yeah. Is what we have tonight, if, if it were to start, I mean if they were to pull the switch and this thing just broke out in utter terror and torment all around us and we didn't even have time to get in our car and get home before they showed up at our door and they pulled out the guns and said, if you don't deny the Lord, you're all dead. If it happened that quickly, do we have enough in us right now to help us to be what we should be for God? Wow. So we talked about the, the church being the, that, uh, that, that net, that safety net for the person that's in the window if he falls out to be able to help that person. That's what the church, that local church has got to be that. But me, as a member of that local church, me as a part of my family, and especially me as the head of my family, do I have enough in me tonight to help not only be me, but to help my family? Yeah. And to be a part of a church that I would not be a hindrance to our church, but I would be a help to our church. Yeah. And so we really don't know what we're going to do. So we better, we better examine our hearts and say, Lord, would you help us? Help us to be what you would have us to be. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy in these verses of Scripture because Paul knew he was going to be leaving. Paul knew that he wasn't going to be there for Timothy to call him up on the phone and say, Paul, I need some counsel tonight. I need some help tonight. Man, you wouldn't know what these Baptists over here are doing to me. I need help. Paul was going to leave the scene. And it was going to be Timothy and the Lord alone. So what, what is he going to do and what are we going to do in our lives? Here's what he says in Ephesians 6, 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the evil day. I'll tell you, the evil day is coming, and having done all to stand. And so Paul is going to talk to this preacher boy, and he's going to share some thoughts with him, and let's look at some thoughts that he has. So as I, as I mentioned, we're going to look at these backwards. I've got five thoughts. We're only going to look at, <laughs> we're going to look at two of them tonight. <laughs> I love all good people. Anyway, hair gets down in my eyes and I can't see what I'm trying to think. You know, and, uh, so look, let's look at these. Look at verse number 13, first of all. The Bible says, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Number one question. Is your doctrine sound enough to have it questioned? Is your doctrine, is what you believe sound enough, solid enough in your heart to have it questioned? Now, that doesn't even have to happen in bad days. I mean, somebody could come up, up and ask you a question, but is what you have in your heart sound enough in your heart to have a question? Because it is important for us to know what we believe. Uh, we're not to be like... Uh, like uh, the, 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 the seas of the ocean tossed about with every wind of doctrine. 
We're going to have to be people that are solid in what we know from the Word of God. When I think about this, he says in that verse of Scripture, he talks about holding fast sound words. So we're going to talk about that for just a moment. Then we're going to move on to our second question. Can I, can I talk to you about sound words for just a moment? Do you know what I believe about the Word of God? The Word of God is the only Word, the only Word that is worth trusting. Amen. Amen. The only Word, the only book, this Word of God, this King James Bible is the only book that is worth us trusting. You can read, you know, we got internet now. Years ago, didn't have internet, and you know, there are a lot, there are a lot more books that people did read, just reading books. But people go to the internet for everything. I mean, you can, if you want to do self diagnose if you've got brain cancer, just go online and you can find out how to operate on yourself if you want to. You know, anything and everything is online, I'm telling you right now. And you know what? Most people take it as the gospel truth. But can I tell you, if you want to have something that you truly can trust, that you can lay down and know that what it said today is going to say the same thing tomorrow. It is the infallible, Amen. inerrant, inspired Word of yeah. God. Word of God. Look what it says. Hold fast the form of sound words. I love this word form. Can I, can I talk, that, talk to you about that for just a moment? That word form, F-O-R-M, it literally means a sketch. A sketch. Now remember, they didn't have cameras where they could take a picture of whatever, and they, but they, had, they could sketch things, they could draw things out. Can I tell you, when I thought about that as I was looking at that word today, I began to think about the Word of God. This Bible did not fall out of heaven to men. Even the Ten Commandments that were, that were given to Moses, they didn't fall out of heaven to Moses. They were tables, the first set, there were two sets, the first set of the Ten Commandments God took those out of a stone on earth. He cut them out of the mountain. And He wrote on those first tables the Word of God, the Law, the Ten Commandments. The second set, after Moses broke the first set, the second set, God told Moses to carve out the stones, bring them to Him. And the second set, again, God wrote on them. They didn't fall out of heaven. This Bible that we have today... The Word of God as, they, as it was given to men in the first book of the Bible that was ever written and all the way down to the, to the book of the Revelation, it didn't fall out of heaven. It was revealed by inspiration of God. And I think about the sketch. They will, they will look at something and they would sketch it. They would draw it. They would paint it. They were putting the real, the real, the literal, on a piece of paper. Can I tell you what we have tonight? We have the exact image. If you were to go to heaven tonight, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find what we got in our hands. I don't know if it's in English or what it is, but we have the same, the same, the same exact Word of God today that was pinned down for me and for you and as they and as, that is laid out in heaven. The Word of God. I can put my trust. And he says in that verse of the Scripture, hold fast the, the form of sound words. When I think about the word inspiration, think about this. The word inspiration that we find in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16. Inspiration, it literally means God breathed. You have, a, you have a form of a man laying on the ground. His name was Adam. He was a form of a man made out of dust, made out of dirt, a form of a man until God breathed into that man the breath of life. And can I tell you what we have tonight? We have the Word of God. And if the reason is not like any other book that's ever been penned by man, I want you to know it is because it is God breathed. This is a living book. That's why when this book, when you read it, when you hear it preached, I'm glad that this Word of God, it does a work in your heart like no other book can. You, when the preacher gets up to preach and he's preaching away and he's not lived with you, he doesn't know anything about you, and all of a sudden you feel that prick in your heart, you feel that conviction in your soul, that's not the preacher, that's the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the author of the book, who breathes life into this book. He's the one that does it. And this is a life-changing book. This book, God breathed. It is the very breath of God. It is the very life of God. Think about it. This book is the written image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He, the Word of God in heaven, has given us the Word of God on earth. 
And this is the life of God that we have to be able to hold in our hands, to take with us, read it, to love it, to study it. We can trust this book. Second of all, look what he says again. Hold fast the form of sound words. Look at the words hold fast or holding fast. This word holding fast or hold fast, it literally means to keep a grip on it. Now, there's some people think that we've got to do something to, to protect this Bible from, you know, and I, let, me, let, me, let me stop right there. We are to, to take care of our, of our Bible. Uh, we, we, we need to, this is God's holy word, by the way. Hey. I don't think we ought to sling it around. And I, I'm very careful not to lay anything on my Bible. This is God's holy word. But let me tell you something. What he's talking about here is not me making sure that I defend this Bible to make sure that it stays true. It's true no matter what I do to it or what I do with it. It's, it, it's God's Word. What he's talking about there is in my heart. I am to take this Word of God and hold it fast in my heart. What, what keeps me grounded? What keeps me solid? What keeps me living the way I should live? It's this Bible in my heart. Hey. He says in Psalm 119, verse number 11, Thy Word will I hide in my heart. Now wait a second. If we hide it in our heart, then that won't let anybody else see it. No, just the opposite. If we hide it in our hearts, everybody will see it. Hey, but that, when he says hide it, that literally means to, to, to hide as to cover it. And where the covering is, we have hidden it in our heart. Why? So that I might not sin against thee. We hide it. We have that special place. Why? You know what the devil's going to try to do? The, try, the devil's going to try to come to us and he's going to try to change the word of God. Just tweak it. Devilish, devilishly tweak the Word of God just a little bit. And anytime you fool with the Word of God, there is no little bit of anything when, you, when it comes to handling the Word of God. It is God's Word, and if it's changed one little jot or one little tittle, it's no longer God's Word. But I take that Word of God, and I, and I hold it fast in my own heart that I can be what God wants me to be. That's why we need to make sure that we are studying the Word of God reading the Word of God, and if your mind is able to still do it, memorize the Word of God, that we can have that Word of God in our hearts. How long do we know that we have, that we'll be even able to have a, uh, have a copy of the Word of God that we can have to hold in our hands out in public? We don't have a clue. There are countries in this world, it is illegal, even though people still do it, but it is illegal for a person to have a copy of the Word of God. In Canada, our country to the north, where our son is, is a missionary, our country to the north, this is called the hate book, declared by the Parliament of Canada. Why? Because it teaches, preaches, condemns homosexuality. Because it teaches and preaches and condemns about premarital sex. Because it teaches and preaches and condemns adultery, fornication, and all and the sins that our world is, has, caught, has caught up in and has always been caught up in. So it's a hate book. They condemn the Bible. It, they can still have a Bible, but preachers are not allowed to preach it from the pulpit when it comes to certain things that they have deemed off limits. Illegal. So, we've got to hold on to this book. We, we've got to hold it fast. We've got to get a grip on this Bible in our hearts that we, sh that we can be what God would have us to be. Number three, this is the only book. Number one, it's the only book worth trusting. Number two, it is the only, uh, only word, only book worth guarding. Number three, it is the only word worth committing. The only word, this Bible is the only word worth committing. I want you to listen to some words here, and I want to talk to you about what he says. Verse 13, hold fast the form of sound, sound words, which thou hast heard of me. Would you notice that middle phrase, which thou hast heard of me? All you've got to do is flip the page to chapter number 2, and I want you to listen to this, verse number 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know what Paul was saying? Paul is saying that what I gave you, verse number nine, uh, 13 of chapter number 1, 
in chapter number two, chapter, uh, chapter number two, verse number two, this same word, this word that you've heard from me, I want you now to commit it. You've heard you from me, I want you now to commit it. You know the reason that we're here tonight? You know the reason you heard the gospel when you heard the gospel? You know the reason you're saved? You know the reason we have this Bible? is because Paul gave to Timothy a charge to commit it to faithful men. You know what, what Timothy did? He committed it to faithful men. Those faithful men committed to the other faithful men. And we are here tonight because down the line, years and years and centuries and, and a couple thousand years ago, all the way back yonder, people have been faithful to keep that word of God going and committing. And this is the only book that is worth committing. You ever heard about, of a man by the name of Voltaire? He was a French philosopher. He was an atheist. He was an anti-God, anti-Bible man. And he said, he said, the Bible will be extinct, extinct, before he dies. You know what? They made his house later on. They, they used it as a place to store Bibles. Amen. God has a wonderful sense of humor, you know. But, you know, and there are people today that read Voltaire, there are people that read Darwin, there are people that read all these philosophers, you know, all these people that have been around for centuries and centuries and millennia. But this book is the only one worth committing to commit to our children. You know, the first verse uh, Karen and I taught our, our children, it was not John three sixteen. You know what we taught our children? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's what we taught. The first verse of Scripture we ever taught our kids was that verse of Scripture. We knew that if they weren't going to honor us, they weren't going to honor God. And then what later on we taught them, John 3, 16. We wanted to commit to our children this book. This book. It's the only one that is worth anything to commit to anybody. To pass it on, to pass it on. Our grandsons get married. Joshua's getting married this Saturday, and if the Lord allows them to have children, I want Joshua to do the same thing. I want all my grandchildren to do the same thing, to commit it to their children and others that are faithfully willing to take the Word of God. It, it is a book, the only book that is worth committing, worth committing. Number four, this is the only book, the only word that is worth sharing. That's worth sharing. Look what he says again in verse number 13. Which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You know what we got? We got a world that if you don't, if you don't do it, then you're going to be killed. Do you know how the Muslims took over? They took over by the sword. There are Muslims today in Africa. We were missionaries in Africa at that time in Ivory Coast. There was about 35% population Muslim. Now it's pushing 50% uh, population Muslim. And they are staunch. I mean, they are, they are radical for the, for the Islamic faith. They're radical. I didn't think they were because when we were there, there wasn't any problems going on. But they got radical real quick later on when Jason was there. They, they, they almost died in a civil war over there. They got radical real quick. But let me tell you something. Do you know why they are Muslims, those Africans there? They're not, they're not from Saudi Arabia. They, most of them have never been to Mecca. The Muslims came in from the Middle East, from Saudi Arabia and these places. They came in and they came into the part of Africa where Ivory Coast and all these other places are. And at the point of a sword and a spear forced these people today, their ancestors, to become Muslim or they were going to die. Well, what they had, you know, when we were over there, we could give people, I had one time, one time I ever had anybody to take a track and throw it down, one time. You give them a track, they take a track. Because it didn't bother them to add Jesus with whatever else they had. I mean, they had all their things, they'll just add Jesus to that. So it didn't bother them to add Jesus. Over there, the Muslims in, in Africa, do you know what they wear? They have these amulets, they have these, these bracelets and these necklaces and stuff that are ancient witchcraft practices. They have a marabou, that is a Muslim witch doctor. All they have done is assimilated what the Muslims taught with what they already had, and they had no problem with it. But when it comes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is him and him alone. You don't join him with anything else or anybody else or any other doctrine. Can I just use a word that we see on the back of bumpers, bumper uh, cars and stuff that's made out of these religious symbols? He does not tolerate. 
his glory going to another. Never, never. But I want you to notice what he said. What I gave you, I gave it to you in faith and in love. We, we don't force anyone to get saved, nor can we force. God works by the will of that individual. But it's worth sharing. Because if a religion comes to town, if, let's just use Baptist. If the Baptists come to town and we force everybody to become a Baptist, they are no better off. Matter of fact, they're worse off just like the Jewish proselytes, they're worse off than they were before because they've got a false hope. Because let me tell you something, Baptists have nothing in, our, in ourselves. We have nothing. But it's the gospel. If the Baptists don't preach the gospel, they, might as, they need to go out of business. If we've, if we've just become a social club, we might as well shut the doors and go home because we are blaspheming the name of Christ. Unless we preach the gospel. Paul said... God forbid, it, he, it was against everything that Paul stood for if he didn't preach the gospel. The gospel, it's the only Bible you can share, the, or the only, only word you can share is this book, because it is a life-changing book. Life-changing, just like the Passover, the Passover, the, 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 the 14th day of the month, which we, would be March, April, right in there, it was so, that was so life-changing. The Passover event in Exodus was so life-changing, it became the beginning of months to the Jewish people. The beginning of months. When I was saved, my life began August the 1st, 1971. Radical. I'm a radical. I have been radically changed by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I love it when... Peter, he was questioned by the, Sanhe the Sanhedrin court in Acts chapter number 4. Chapter number 3, he was preaching in the temple. Chapter number 3, they, they got Peter and John, and they hauled him off to their little jail. Chapter number 4, they bring him out to that, that great council of elders of the Jewish people. Just a few months before the Lord Jesus was there, before that same council, they had condemned him to death. Before that same council, as the Lord Jesus was there, we see Peter standing in the alcove out, out just outside. And as they had condemned the Lord to death, so they had brought fear into the heart. Now, he was, Peter wasn't even standing before him. He was out there on the other side of the door. John was inside, but not Peter. But they, they, they wielded so much power that... In, in Peter's mind, they had brought down. You hear, you hear people talk about, hey, I'm gonna bring, we're going to bring him down, you know. We're going to bring whoever down. They brought the Messiah down. That's how much power they had in the mind of Peter. He saw it happen right before his eyes. They, they, they took him away. They hauled him off. And before, let me tell you how bad it was in his heart, the fear of how bad it was in his heart. When he had said in chapter 26 of the book of Matthew, I will never deny you, I will never deny thee. He denied the Lord, not before that body of elders that had just condemned the Lord, and that was in the process of condem condemning the Lord. He denied him three times, and one of those times, twice maybe, but one of those times was in to a little, a young maiden girl. That's how bad it was, the fear that he had in his heart. Now, look what happened after the day of Pentecost. Here he's standing before that same body of men and they're questioning, where, 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 who gave you this right to, to do what you did? Where do you get this power? Who gave you the authority to do what you're doing? He's standing before the, the earthly authority of the Jewish people. These men had the authority to do and say and whatever went on in that, in that nation. They had the power. None of them gave him the power. So who in the world gave you the power? Oh, let me tell you what he did. That one just a few months before he had denied, he stood there and he began to preach. Jesus. And he said, neither is there salvation in any other. For as there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And boy, they looked at these two dummies. They looked at these two uneducated men. They, I mean, they, they came from the hills of Tennessee. And they took knowledge of them. Even though they were un, ignorant and unlearned men, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. This word, hold fast, this word that we can share in love and in faith because 
we have been with Jesus. That's how we can do it. Number two, my second question. Number one, is your doctrine sound enough to have it questioned? If you stay in this book, God can help you to have that strong doctrine in your heart. Number, number two, let me get to my points. I didn't even get all that point. You're going to say amen to that. I didn't even finish all, all of point number one. Number two, is your, calling, is your calling sure enough to have it challenged? Is your calling sure enough to have it challenged? He says in verse number nine, who have saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. I don't have time to get into verse number 10, 11, and 12. But let me just say something about the, the calling before I get into what I want to... I want to say something about the calling before I get into what I want to say about the calling. <laughs> Did you know that there is... Some people deny it, some people don't believe it, but there is a special calling that God gives a man to preach God's word. It is not an occupation. It is not a decision that you say, well, I think I'll start preaching. They make good money. Well, number one, well, both them things are wrong. You know, I told, I told somebody, I said, we got four preachers out of our five grandsons. We got four, four of them been called to preach and uh, we have one accountant. And that poor accountant, he's so deceived. He thinks he's going to take care of the four preachers' money. Uh, they won't be enough to keep him alive, much less them alive, you know. Um, but there is a special divine calling of God. When God, and I think about that, and uh, I don't understand. I, now, 50 years later, and when, when I surrendered to preach, I'd been saved a month and 13 days. And I truly didn't understand, understand what was going on in my life. I didn't understand what God was doing in my heart. Brother, the honor of it and the glory of it, 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 it just, uh, we don't understand why God would choose somebody like me. I, I just don't truly, truly, I can't fathom why God would do that, except that he would choose that which is weak and, and, and that which is unlovely. Um, he would choose somebody like me, that if I will trust him, that all glory would go to God, that no, glory should, that no flesh should, could glory in his presence. That's the only reason I know he'd choose somebody like me. But there's a special calling, and that's what Paul is talking to Timothy, his preacher boy. Paul had that calling of God. Timothy had the calling of God. So there is a calling, and most of you tonight, you don't fit into that, that special calling of being a preacher. But let me also go on to say that as there is a special calling, there is also a definite leading. There's a special calling to preach, but there's also a special leading to serve God. Now, you may not have a calling to preach, but you can have a definite leading of God to serve God. Now, we, there are certain, some things we all got to do, just straight across the board. We got to do, read our Bible, pray, witness. Those are things we do. But at the same time, there are things that God does. I think about a God-called preacher. That special leading of God is sometimes for that man to stand in a pulpit and preach God's word as a pastor. Sometimes that special leading of God is for him to, get, to go to the mission field. Sometimes that special leading of God is to be an evangelist. Sometimes that special leading of God is to, to work in a rescue mission or in a print shop printing tracts and Bibles. And I mean, there's special leadings of God to teach a Sunday school class. God burdens somebody's heart to teach a Sunday school class. There's a special, I believe God gives some people that special gift of being a, can I just use it said this way, a blessing to other people cooking a meal, doing things for people, writing a note of encouragement. God touches people's hearts in different ways. So with whatever God is leading you to do and the ministry that God will have you to do in your own particular life, can I say this? Is it strong enough in you that when it is challenged, you're still willing to go on and do it anyway? Because let me tell you, the devil's not going to leave you alone just to do whatever, whatever you feel God wants you to do. He's not going to let you do that. He is going to challenge you. <coughs> He's going to fight against you. 
I mean, it is not going to be easy to serve God in whatever capacity. And by the way, and let me just get to this. I had two little points I wanted to give under this. Who are those that challenge us? I think about Moses had that great calling of God to go down in Egypt and lead the people of God uh, out, of e- uh, out of Egypt. He called Aaron to be that high priest. And here, at, while they're out there in the book of Numbers, they're out there in the wilderness uh, because of the penalty of their sin. Here we come, have a man by the name of Korah. He comes up with Dathan and Abiram, and they're challenging Moses and Aaron. Now remember, Korah is of the tribe of Levi. He was a Levite. He had a special calling of God as a Levite to help the priest. But you know what the problem was? You know where the problem comes when people challenge us? People challenge you? There's two, the word is jealousy, period. Why? Two things. Number one, they think the job that they have is too little for them. They want the big job. The second thing is they think that you're too little for the big job that you got. And that's what happened with Moses and, and Korah. Korah was a Levite. I don't like my little job I got. I don't like it. I want the big job. I want to be able to be able to meet with God. And I want to be able to go into the tabernacle. I want to hear the voice of God. And I want all you know that I know. Can I tell you whatever God tells me to do? It is special. And it's right. And it's, it fits me to whatever God wants me to be and to do. It is just exactly to fit me. And if I try to take anybody else's job, let me, let me tell you, I think about Miss Jane back there. If I were to make a jar of pickle relish, that, that person that ate it would be dead by morning. I ain't kidding. I'll tell you. If they wasn't dead, they'd wish they were dead. You know? What we have to do. God gave it to us to do. And if God wants me to do it, He doesn't want anybody else to do it. It's my job. And I believe just as, as much as somebody is jealous for my job, I ought to be jealous for my job. Not in the sense of, hey, let me tell you what God gave me. No, 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 no. But to be jealously protective, just like a husband is jealously protective of his wife and his family. And he's not going willing for somebody to just come and run them over. He's going to protect them. I think that's all the way we ought to be with our, fam- with our job that God gave to us. Who challenges us? Our friends sometimes, our foes sometimes, they challenge us to come against us. But I'm glad it's a heavenly calling, it's a high calling, it's a holy calling of God that he has for us. And he's called us with a heavenly calling because he wants us to be partakers with him, with Christ. It's a high calling. You know why? Because it's a prize for us to go for, to serve God. Not the, I'm not talking about a crown. I'm talking about it, it's, it's like winning the race and coming out on top when he's called us, when he's led us into doing something with him. I mean, it, you can't get any better than serving God. Can't even better. And it's a holy calling. It is a holy calling. Because when we are handling God's word, when we are working with God's people, it is a holy priesthood. It is is a holy business that we have to serve God. So let me ask you again, is your doctrine sound enough to have it questioned? If people come up and ask you, Paul, Peter says that we're to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh us of the faith that is in us. Is Is it sound enough for people to question us and we could give them an answer? Is our calling sure enough to have it challenged? We are settled in what God wants us to do, or are we blown about all over the place and never settled? I got a problem with people that are never settled and they never finish their job. Got a problem with it. I think we ought to be where God wants us to be until He leads us to do something else. And when He leads us to do something else, you better go and not stay. But is it? Is it right? Let's stand to our feet, our heads are bowed, and our eyes are closed. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I'm telling you, we're living in days that I think what we're doing is going to be challenged and questioned more and more. Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Pastor Billy Balcom. For more information about New Beginning Baptist Church and our ministries, please visit our website at wwwnbbc 280 Org. If you have any questions about our church or comments about this video, please use the contact page on our website or send an email to crane.t at nbbc280.org. May the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace for today and bright hope for tomorrow.